And automation refers to the creation of a sequence of images drawn thanks to or produced by other artists methods that change over time to portray the illusion of, emo of emotion. And content, so I'm going to discuss the history of animation, rotoscoping, special. And my two um, that I'm going to go into detail are rotoscoping and stop motion. Um, going back to the beginning, you know, ancient times, um, you're talking about one, one of the first first um, examples of animation, well, the birth of animation would be in Chauvet Cave in France. Um, and it was only discovered in 1994 by cavers. It probably hadn't, hadn't been seen for tens of thousands of years before that. It's from 35,000 years ago. But what they did was they draw animal, a lot of animals, but they'd have, say, this one, the buffalo or the bison, would have more than four legs, say eight, eight legs. And when it would flicker in the candlelight and give the illusion of movement. Um, in Kakadu Park in Australia, the Aboriginals, um, they did the same sort of thing as well. So this is it as well. But because it's so fragile, they've actually, what they've actually done is they've, they've built a, a replica of the caves above ground now. And this, this gives you an idea. They're projecting the... Um, you know, the drawings and you know, recreating them. And in Iran, 5,200 years ago, um, it, there is, um, a pot pottery was discovered. And when it's spun around, it gives the, the illusion of motion and um, animation, and that's a little goat. Um, and if you're ever, ever in Iran, it's in, it's in the museum, there it is there. Um, Egypt, that, that's quite important in the development of animation. Um, the tomb of, in Beni Hassan, um, there's events depicting a um, wrestling match. Um, here you go, there. And you, it, it depicts movement over time, and you know, it's primitive form of animation. And you know, if it was, it was put together, you know, image over image, you, you'd, have, you'd have a very realistic animation. Um, 1200 BC in Rome as well, it, sorry, in um, Egypt, they had the Book of the Dead. There's one that was found and it was 37 meters long. Um, and basically it was used for the dead to guide them into the next life. And this is, this is part of it. But um, yeah, that was, that was, you know, again, it showed the movement of time. Um, in Rome, there's a column called um, Trajan, it's column. That's from 113 AD. And there's um, bas reliefs, and it shows um, war, um, war of Damascus. But when you, when you follow it around, it's, it, it shows the whole, whole event. And it's, you know, it's, it's, very, it's primitive, but it's, it's, very, you know, it's very, very well done. It's, if you're ever in Rome, it's worth the look. Um, in China, Ding Huang, he was, um, he, the, the zoetrope, some say he was instrumental in finding that initially. That was um, first century BC. But what they did over there was umbrellas um, and have paintings. And with the light going through, that would help to project, project movement, especially when it's spun, spun around. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, in fifth, around 1510, he did two folios. Um, it's in the Windsor Collection, um, Anatomical Studies. And what he showed was the movement of the body. But when you look at it, especially the one, the one on the right, this subtle movements, um, which you know, it's you know he, he kind of he, animation was you know one of the things he was looking at. And um, two hundred years before the magic lantern, and um, Da Vinci actually did drawings of a model that was was similar, but it, it did not happen in his lifetime. Uh, Magic Lantern happened around 1658, um, and it could project images onto a wall. What it used was glass and paintings, and it would use um, natural daylight or candles. So it was quite weak, but as you know, as light bulbs, um, the invention of light bulbs, it helped. You know, it became more powerful and it could be shown to a bigger audience. Um, Tromatov, 
simple toy that was um, popular in the 19th century. It was basically a disc, and you'd flick it between the two. This is actually a modern one. You'd flick it between the two, and it would show, um, you know, show movement. But interestingly, in the caves in France, they actually found a disc, and it showed an animal on, on the other side. Um, you know, when, when it was flicked between the two, it showed movement as well. So actually, they think it's going back 35,000 years, the first. So that civilization, you know, they were, they were well ahead of their time. And um, the, not too good on this one. Kind of kisses scope, and um, it was a disc, um, and images were placed in this, around the center, and when it moved around, it gave the illusion of emotion. And I particularly like this one. It's very, very beautiful. And Zotrope, 1833. It went, to, you know, this was a bit of an advance. Um, it was a cylinder where images were put placed in the center. When it spun around, it gave the, gave the illusion of movement. But the one, thing, the one important thing about this, the slits in the side, um, here's, here's an example I'll show it to you now. They're all, they're all I mean, probably cardboard things. So when, you look at, inside you can see so when you look at there are above, pictures. And when we have it spin, and it's going around, it makes no sense, it just gets blurry. The pictures but what you need is, and it doesn't really look like much. When you go down and look through the side, you see the movement. And now we've got a bunch of birds flying. And what's particularly important in that one is, um, it's, it's using um, the persistence of vision um, concept that was, um, it was developed in the late 1800s. There's another one called um, Phi Phenomenon. It's an optical illusion of receiving um, still images um, when viewed in rapid mo succession as continuous motion. Some say it's actually um, it's more important than the persistence of vision in, in animation and film. Um, in 1868, the flipbook um, was invented, and it's also called the kineograph. Um, yeah, I remember as a nipper, we always do this at the corner of pages. But unfortunately, it's dying out. With, um, you can't do it with a laptop or a little tablet. But great fun. Um, a lot of, lot of animators, early animators um, particularly, said this, this was um, you know, a big inspiration in getting into animation. Because you know, it, it showed the possibilities more than what had probably gone before. Um, the Praxinoscope, 1877, um, this was projection um, in Paris, and it was, before Moybridge, it was, it was a precursor to um, motion picture. Um, now I'm going to go on to um, rotoscoping, um, one, of, one of the specialist ones I'm looking at. Uh, it was 1915, it's also um, coming on as roto and it's invented by Max Flescher. Um, it's an animation technique where animators trace over motion picture footage, frame by frame, um, where realistic action is required. Um, what happened was, this is, this is his original invention, this is, um, I think this is the, pa the patent, but uh, this is rear projection, and you could also have front, front, front projection as well. Um, this is one of his early ones, it's called Out of Inkwell. Ink and he was also quite famous for um, his brother, um, Coco the Clown, in, I think it was, I'm not too sure what date it was, but I'll just, I'll just give you a look at Coco the Clown anyway. So what he did was he got his brother to dress in a clown outfit. He projected onto, you know, using his rotoscope machine and then traced the outline. <coughs> And here's examples of Moybridge's horses after being rot rotoscoped. And um, this one here is particularly interesting on the right hand side. That was actually done on, on metal coins. And um, 
he was extremely um, influential in the world of animation, um, and he went on to do Popeye, Betty Boop cartoons, and the, he did Gulliver's Travels in 1939. And here is Gulliver's Travels. And he was very, very, um, Walt Disney, um, they took a lot of his, his techniques. Um, rotoscoping also is used in um, Star Wars. Um, the lightsabers, what happened was, they, they get the, um, say, this is just an example here. You can see the, um, the saber originally. They rotoscope it out and then paint over a blur, and that's what was used. Um, another one as well, Last Waltz, um, a documentary by Martin Scorsese. Um, Neil Young had a big lump of cocaine hanging out his nose. So Scorsese used rotoscoping to get rid of, rid of that. Um, Ralph Bashi, um, he used it extensively in Wizards, Lord of the Rings, Fire and Ice. Probably one of the most famous um, for, well, for my generation. Um, the MTV generation was um, Take On Me. Um, it was approximately 3,000 frames of rotoscope. It took 16 weeks to complete, and each one was penciled separately. What they did was quite interesting. This is the set. You can see it down here. <coughs> so the set behind is actually all drawn. So they only had to rotoscope the characters themselves for most of it. And here is a look at the video. <coughs> Great tune as well. So you can see the stage behind there, the set. James Bird remembers that. Um, Yeah, but it, the one thing about rotoscoping originally was a, it was a hugely time-consuming process with a huge number of hours required. But with, with, with um, computers, it's become a lot less cumbersome and, and programs such as Adobe After Effects and Diffusion have automated the process to an extent. As well as that, the, the original rotos idea of rotoscoping has moved on a lot. And masking and green screen can be seen to have their origins in rotoscoping. Um, next, I'm going to cover stop motion animation. Um, it originally started in around 1898, and the first was created by Albert Smith and Stuart Blackton, and they called it the Humpty Dumpty Circus 1898. Unfortunately, I've not been able to get any footage of that. Um, stop motion, it's um, where an object is moved in small increments, um, and in individually photographed. Generally speaking, 25, you know, 24, 25 frames a second. Early, in the early days, it was done at around 12 frames a second, but um, that actually, there's quite a lot of flicker, and that's one of the reasons, like, the, the movies is called The Flicks, there was quite a lot of flicker. So, you know, 24, 25 just improves it. Um, Willis O'Brien was a very famous practitioner. He did The Lost World as well as King Kong. Um, and. Yeah, this is one of the first times it was shown, you know, to a mass audience in film. Um, Ray Har Harry Harrison, um, he, he learned under O'Brien and went on to create um, some very famous films using stop motion, including Jason the Argonauts. And here we go. Um, claymation, um, one of my favorites is Claymation. Um, and this, this is, you know, the foundation of Wallace and Gromit and Morph. But in 1975, um, um, Will Vinton and sculptor Bob Gardner created a film called Close Mondays. And actually, it was the first um, motion, stop motion to um, win an Oscar. And there's a documentary actually made called Claymation as well. Arvin Studios. Um, the, these are the makers of Wallace and Gromit, um, and they took on let's see, Nick Park. When was it? It was in 1985. But that was founded by um, Peter Lord and David Sproxton. 
Um, in 1976, a character called Morph was created. Um, you know, people from the 80s will remember this, kids from the 80s. It was a little plasticine figure. Um, yeah, look, great little fellow. Um, Nick Park, 1985, what he did was he actually started writing um, A Grand Day Out as a kid. <coughs> Um, and he was in Sheffield, Sheffield um, College, but he, he got taken on by Ardman in 1985. And one of the first things he worked on was Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer, um, working on the chickens. But um, Ar um, Ardman allowed him to, um, to work on a, on a grand day out. And originally, he was a bit too ambitious. He had, hadn't planned it that well. It would have taken years, well, would have taken a hell of a lot longer to make, but they kind of, they got him to be a bit more, um, probably professional about it, and a bit more cutthroat. So it was actually broadcast on Channel 4 in 1990, and won many awards. Um, this is um, a clip from a grand day out. No, it's not. And this film was highly, um, inf you know, highly influ influential, and um, it brought back the popularity of animation, especially um, stop motion. Um, he went on to make Chick Chicken Run, Chew on the Sheep, and others. And um, here's here's a quick look at, um, you know, some the production of one of them. Um, let's see. So basically, this, this little guy, um, his head has been replaced. Um, the sets are very, very elaborate, the lighting, um, and so they'd have different heads um, for different expressions. Yeah, here's an example. And just save time, um, yeah, and just a lot more flexible in what they could show. And um, yep, the set set design is an extremely important part of it, um, and photography as well. Like we did with our Lego, it was kind of like um, I think they they shot quite a few of them on Canon 5D, but um, yeah, it was just kind of moving and sliding. And 25, 25 frames a second was I think it was. And these are probably the most famous ones: Sean the Sheep, Chicken Run, and Wallace and Gromit. And that is it. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.